So I would like to invite to the stage my panelists, David Giori, CEO at Banking Reports, Alessandro Hadami, founder of Pacemakers, author, speaker, investor, and mentor, and Christian Sarafidis, chief BDO, worldwide financial services at Microsoft. Firstly, I would like to congratulate the previous panel. It was impressive what we heard, and it really touched me as a person who is facing these issues, and I mean all of us in the corporate world. But in this panel, we're discussing about navigating the future of finance. Please introduce yourselves. Let's start with David. Okay. Uh, can you hear me in the back? Yes? Perfect. All right. So I am David Yuri. And my primary activity is to provide training programs to bankers like you all over the world. I have been working in over 60 countries globally in the past 15 years. And this is my first time in Cyprus. There is only one big problem. I already fell in love with Cyprus. Um, my... Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, my, uh, my secondary activity is to provide advisory services to CEOs and boards of banks about innovation, digital transition, uh, beautiful but tough topics. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to Alessandro. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Alessandro Hatami. I um, have a long story. I'll make it short for you. I'm Italian-Iranian living in London for over 30 years. Um, I'm an engineer, civil engineer, but I now work in fintech. I used to do roads and railways in Nigeria and Guinea, and now I do innovation technology in, in London. So it's a big change. And my change happened after my MBA, which led me to work with um, G Capital to get into financial services. I built their first website. Uh, during the dot-com crisis, so I got into internet quite early on. I then became employee 11 at PayPal, so the first wave of innovation with them. I then became the CEO of PayPoint.net and the CEO of digital banking at Lloyd. So a background back and forth between um, established companies and uh, innovators. I then set up my own firm, uh, Pacemakers, which is an advisory firm, and we help do a very niche thing. So we help large corporates innovate, but we help them innovate by acquiring or investing in other companies. So we work with them to identify exactly what they want to change, and we help them identify a target or targets to work with, but we do it in an approach that is not this company's right for you, or we map the whole market for them so they make an intelligent decision with that. And so very much a headhunter for businesses if you want. Um, in parallel to all of this, I also mentor startup early stage companies because I feel that working with innovators and startups actually makes established old folks like me uh, realize that things can change and things can improve and get that exposure is fundamental uh, and also good opportunities to invest because you can get good returns from that. And I also like to speak publicly about my thoughts, which sometimes are, are not everybody agrees with. So. Oh, cool. Alessandro, you've done a lot of things. I mean, we need two or three lifetimes to do what you did up to now. You're very kind. <laughs> I'm very old, though. Okay, now let's move on to Christian. Yeah, you, you already have seen... Does it work? Hello, hello? Oh, okay, that sounds good. So you already have seen my face this morning. Um, I work at Microsoft in the Worldwide Financial Services Organization. Actually, I have a payments background. At, uh, as Matteo alluded a little bit earlier, I spent a lot of years at, uh, at Swift. This is where my passion for payments uh, came. Uh, on top of what I'm doing at Microsoft, I'm also investing in fintechs, payments fintechs, um, and I'm also advising some other fintechs as well. Thank you very much. I will start with David. David, your experience as a CEO of Banking Reports gives you unique insights into both fintech and the banking industry. So how do you see these two uh, sectors converging? And uh, what opportunities does this convergence present? 
Okay, in the past three years, the financial technology table has turned. I mean, after the 2008 crisis, interest rates were low. It was easy to get funding for a startup, for a risky project. And uh, actually, fintech was booming. However, uh, due to monetary expansion and other secondary reasons, interest rates are now up, and they will keep uh, going up to a certain extent. This means that financial technology startups, the approximately 50,000 small, nimble, flexible, colorful, dynamic, exponential financial technology startups around the globe, they have everything unchanged, less funding, and they are under increased profit pressure. Why? Because interest rate is the price value, is the time value of money. And if interest rates are up, investors want prompt profitability. You, fintech startup number 49,722, can you return, can you give me positive return on my investments now or not? Anyway, meanwhile, well-managed banks, and in the past 5,000 years, the primary profit source of balance sheet banking has been a net interest rate margin. And actually, historically, there is a strong and clear positive correlation between nominal interest rate levels in the economy and profitability of balance sheet traditional banks. Why? Because the net interest rate margin itself is wider if interest rates are higher. So the same high interest rates, everything unchanged, are making well-managed banks not the ones recently going down through amateur mistakes and faults, but the well-managed banks with quality assets and liabilities significantly more profitable. So this is the time for traditional banks to make a strategic move and the table has turned compared to the fintech boom era, and these two industries will actually converge through mergers, acquisitions, even hostile takeovers, as well as necessary co-opetition. What is this co-opetition? Cooperation with your competitors. So I guess the only way for this to change is to lower inflation, because it's a cycle. When you have high inflation, then the interest rates go up, and then companies, all companies have loans, then it means that it's, it will be more expensive for them to p repay their loans, and this means more expenses, so it lowers the profits of the company and the profitability of the investors, and they tend to sell more shares during these times. Exactly. I mean, higher interest rates uh, are not very good for small startups, even through credit funding or equity funding. I went through the logic of equity funding. Now you have augmented it with the logic of credit funding. Yes. Thank you, David. He's doing a great job to keep us awake before the party, right? It's Oh, that's great. Absolutely fantastic. You're so yeah. excited. Thanks. That's nice. Okay, Christian, you have more than 25 years of experience. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know that? <laughs> she killed me now. <laughs> Into the international market. Thank you, Stiliana. <laughs> it's supposed to be something good. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Could you share a, a pivotal moment in your journey that shaped your perspective on the evolving landscape of finance and technology? Yes, yeah, absolutely, thank you. As, as we said this morning, 
um, I was explaining that there is a direct co a correlation between technology evolution and GDP growth. So uh, we could see this moments, these pivotal moments where the industry is, is changing. Um, I have to admit, I was there when the first PC started. <laughs> and I bought an Apple II, so sorry. But, uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I was amongst the first one to buy this uh, smartphone that changed the industry, obviously. And then, of course, cloud. And, and what I was alluding to this morning, and there was a fantastic panel around uh, AI, is AI is, is here for many years. What has changed is this new capability that we call generative AI, which complements many other ways of, uh, of AIs. One thing that I would like to highlight here over these years, and by the way, I will all stay, always stay young, so don't believe that I'm so old, uh, close the parenthesis. You, through all these pivotal moments, let's face it, financial industry has been very resilient. I remember the time where the internet was booming, Everybody says that's the end of the banks. Actually not. They learn from this and they leverage this new technology evolution to make it something better and creating e-banking. When smartphones were there, oh, finished, the banks are dead. No. They actually brought financial services to the, uh, to the smartphones. So actually the key learning is that financial services industry is very, very resilient overall. Maybe slow sometimes, but sometimes it helps to accelerate, like what happened with, um, with COVID. And maybe to, to conclude, what I'm going to say is, I don't know if you recall, and you're going to kill me again, do you remember Mosaic, this famous browser, one of the first browser with images on the internet? Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I see some people, so like young like me. Um, why Mosaic was so successful? Internet was there for already many years. It's just that it brought a new capability uh, to internet and everybody was starting to, uh, to adopt it, people and businesses and so forth. And what I'm saying here is that what we see with generative AI and AI is this mosaic moment that happens now. AI is here for many, many years already, but that's how I would phrase it actually. Generative AI is the mosaic moment of AI. And in the future, if you want me to talk about the future, yeah, a year ago, everybody was talking about Metaverse, Web3, everything will change in the world. Everybody was investing in Metaverse. Where are we now? So That's probably so not top of mind anymore, although some institutions continue to invest there. That is true. The future, future, we will see maybe quantum computing. We will see, but we are not there yet. It doesn't mean that Web3 will not be a thing in the future. No, that's not what I'm saying. What is that? That's not what I'm saying. But you see the dynamic is changing. We cannot say today that Web3 was a pivotal moment, like yes. I could say it for generative AI today. If one thing we can say for sure is that we cannot predict the future. And so I see some people using AI to generate advice, but advice without the human factor and human psychology, how can you have an accurate answer on what you're asking. Yeah, totally, that's a fair point. And I was trying to explain this also this morning, actually, uh, the way, uh, sorry, I'm going to talk about Microsoft for a second again, but the way we branded what we do with Copilot is exactly to your point, is great, it's a capability, it's not yet perfect, but actually Copilot is a Copilot, you need a pilot, the pilot is the human being. So it's very important to keep the human being in the center, to amplify his own capabilities. This is true. And even if I ask ChatGPT to suggest the five stocks with the most potential, because this is what I do, uh, the ChatGPT will answer based on previous data that there is. No one can predict actually how industries are going to develop in the future. Well, if you talk about ChatGPT 3 or 3.5, yeah, that's correct. It was until the end of uh, 2021. Now GPT 4 goes much, much uh, further. Uh, and actually, thanks to the collaboration with FinTechs, FinTechs can build plugins actually with very, very recent data, taking very accurate data r right now. So this is, this is being addressed actually. Absolutely, but that's a very good question. I wanted to ask from before the, the panel for the AI, but they didn't have time, so I ask now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> And now, Alessandro, so you have a role as an advisor, a speaker, a mentor. I need another half an hour to say what else you're doing. 
an investor in the digital innovation and think tank highlight your commitment to fostering growth. So could you share a piece of advice you often find yourself giving to startups entering the fintech landscape? Um, very, very simple, and you've heard it a million times. Um, focus on outcome. Focus about what you're trying to achieve. Um, an interesting discussion that I have. I, by the way, I totally disagree with what you were saying just oh, earlier. Oh, fantastic. Um, <laughs> so uh, banks are not guaranteed to survive forever. Banking is, okay? So I talk about the I, industry, not the so bank. I talk well, about financial. You said banks. And uh, I know this guy, this entrepreneur from a company in Seattle that said, you know, we don't need banks, we need banking. I don't know if you know, have heard about him. Okay, Bill Gates. I told them not to bring that up because they were arguing from before we start. But So uh, I think what, what we need to realize is that this is what we are in society, are down, a transformational moment. So technology is completely transforming everything. This is the same as when the first automobile came out and carriages were going around. So we don't, um, the business of the carriages was not to take horses around town with people or on top, of the, on top of the carriages. The business of the carriages was to transport people. When the car came, it became their business and the business was completely evaporated. Similarly, when you look at e-commerce and the bot.com boom of 2000, um, retail did not survive. Uh, retail survived as a business. The retailers are not around anymore. So the big companies that were dominating the market and nobody said they were untouchable, the Sears, Robux of this world and some of the big ones in the UK and Europe, they've disappeared not because retail has disappeared. Retail is actually much, much bigger than it ever was before. Is that it changed. It's an evolution. The same is happening in banking. So again, the, as you said, uh, the advice that I would give uh, to anybody thinking about fintech is think about the outcome. What is that you're trying to achieve? You're not trying to sell a credit card, a loan, or something. You're trying to sell something that the business, that the, comp that the individual needs, your customer needs. And fundamentally, um, users of banking services need three things. They need to pay or receive payment. They need to borrow because they don't have enough money. Or they want to protect a bit of extra that they have. And this little bit of extra goes from, as it can go into savings accounts, into investment products, to insurance, and to uh, pensions, for example. Uh, these three things are what we want to do, but what they need is a trusted entity in the middle that gives them the best of breed to be able to choose. This is what a bank does. If you tell a banker, forget about providing all the different credit kinds, but tell them to, uh, forget about creating a, a credit card product, an overdraft product, a personal loan, a mortgage, etc., and say, just create a credit line, they will laugh at you. They will be very frightened. If you tell them, do not sell them your products, but be a whole of market entity so that a customer can come in and through you invest in anybody, buy any pension, buy any insurance policy, they will go crazy. If they tell you, when the customer comes and wants to pay something, you don't tell them uh, what you want to use. Do you want to use Visa, MasterCard? Do you want to do a transfer, transfer or do you want to do instant payments? You just say, do you want to do it fast or you want to do it quick? Uh, fast or you want to do it cheap? And choose the one that is the best, is best for you. Banks cannot do this because they have too many established silos of profitability that are that, but fintechs in theory could do that. So fintechs that are not going to think like banks may succeed, banks that will change their mind may succeed, but ultimately the on, all the ones that succeed in both the big established organizations and the smaller ones will be the ones that focus on outcome and the outcome that the customer expects. Are you suggesting that fintechs are competing or should compete with banks because they do things that the banks cannot do? So it's interesting that we think, are the fintechs and banks competing? Are we joking? Of course they are. They're going after the customer's mind space. They're going after the customer's capability to uh, benefit from their amount. They are competitors. Will they work together because they can reach their, their objectives better? Absolutely. Will they compete with each other? Absolutely. Okay? But they are a new way of banking. It's called the fintech. Okay? They're competitors. Well, I completely disagree with this. <laughs> <laughs> I see clearly a collaboration between the two. However, it's possible. It's to, possible, but to, it's not necessary. Yeah, absolutely. No, what, where I, I will join you is actually we need a clear definition of what a fintech is. When we talk about a fintech, some people resonate in terms of, oh, this is a startup. Or a bank can be a startup. Absolutely. All banks are tech companies right now, so they're all potentially fintechs. You see what I mean? So we need look, first BBVA to agree said, on BBVA the said that they were going to, that they, they could not be a bank. This chairman of BBVA said, oh, the BBVA in the future is not going to be a bank. It's going to be a, a software company. What are they now? Are they, sorry, any BBVA people, I apologize to you. There, I, I really have lots of respect for BBVA. But are they truly yes. transforming the world? I don't know. I don't see. Are they a software company or are they still a bank? They're are a bank. they offering a good, good service to the clients? Are they? 
Yeah. Have you asked them in Mexico? Have yeah. To? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we need to have offline conversation with my mates. Sorry to bore you guys. <laughs> I have to set them straight. <laughs> So basically, the end result probably will be digitally native, digital only or almost entirely digital, digitally excellent form of regulated banking. Now, you can get to this end result through different ways. One way is a banking gap. 50, 16 years after Steve Jobs introduced the first iPhone on the 29th of June 2007, sorry for mentioning Steve Jobs, you are from Microsoft, I am sorry. I, I, I will survive. <laughs> Steve, Steve Ballmer, then CEO of Microsoft, is my other favorite. Okay, now we are all right. So, um, uh, 16 years after Steve Jobs so happily and passionately introduced the first iPhone on stage, now banks, typically the good banks, the good ones, are getting mobile banking right. The mobile banking application of leading retail banks is typically, finally, after more than one and a half decades, is high quality, actually. And they got the entire development process right. Were they slow? Yes. Did, it get, did they get it right? Yes. What is another path? Not banking app, but app banking. What is an app bank, a digital only bank, a licensed bank, an entity owning a full banking license, but only pursuing two channels, iOS for iPhone users and Android for Samsung and other Android phone users. These are the only two channels they are pursuing, and they are digital only. But there is a third path getting there, and that is a mobile wallet. Currently, today, approximately, according to ACI Worldwide, their newest research, I know their head of research, approximately 70%, 70 percent, seven zero percent of adults globally globally use one or more mobile wallets, regulated as e-money institutions, stored value facilities, prepaid cards, whatever, but not owning a full banking license. All these three paths are good to get there. David, will you allow me to challenge you a little bit? So I'll, I share your passion about exactly what you, what you okay. said, but I would like to make the link with the previous panelists as, as well. Okay. They cover many topics, but DNI in particular. Now, okay. we can get excited by all the app banking or the banking app and, and mm. so forth. That's fantastic. How do you address the people who are not so tech savvy, maybe the older people or people who cannot read, who can, cannot write and, and so forth? How are you going to organize the access to financial services for these people? I have my answer, but I would like to hear what's your point of view on this? It's a brilliant question. And uh, you know, uh, uh, I am going all around the world. And in different regions of the world, there are different uh, slogans, different uh, smart little sentences, half sentences circulating among people uh, in a conference, for example. And, uh, you know, uh, in some parts of the world, they look at Europe as a very advanced, very safe, very well organized, very much rules driven continent, but socio demographic a little bit old continent. Look at the uh, median age in certain 
countries in Europe, okay? Now, now uh, in some other uh, uh, continents, in some conferences, I hear this uh, little uh, motto, this little uh, se half sentence, you know, David, look at Europe and look at the boards of the well-established large banks. There is no one on those bank boards who can use a smartphone better than a three years old. Uh, you know? Now, uh, therefore, this technology adoption is a generational thing. I mean, honestly, I have specific stories about three years old children solving things with a smartphone in one minute, which I never explained to them, which I couldn't solve for one month. Things like this. So digitally natives, millennials, uh, Generation Z, they are coming to the table. And the, this uh, story is not symmetric, it's asymmetric. Baby boomers are very, very much honorable people, statistically speaking. They want to learn digital channels. They are trying to become digitally excellent. Obviously, they were born at a time when internet, touch screens, smartphones didn't exist, but they are doing their best to become good technology users. Meanwhile, the, old, uh, the young millennials, Generation Z, they are digitally oriented and they don't want to reciprocate the enthusiasm of baby boomers. They don't want to become excellent in traditional channels. They don't want to go to a bank branch, sit there for one and a half hours, sweat, look at their smartphones losing the battery, and then open up a bank account by signing 222 pages of printed material. They think that opening up a bank account should be like opening up a new Gmail address or starting a new group on Facebook. Anyway, you, you know these things. This is my vision. New generation, new approach. Thank you so much, David. Can I ask you a question? Do you feel like fintech is the evolution of banking? Because fintech companies, for example, start with an app and banks have been so many years out there without having um, an app. And they're also competitors because once we saw that there is an easier way to do things through fintech, they also adopted these, some of their strategies, some of the fintech strategies. Who wants to answer this? I'll, I'll take that on. Um, I think the app is irrelevant, okay? Uh, all that matters is the user experience and the outcome. So the ideal version for a, for a bank of the future is the bank of the Middle Ages where you would have a conversation like what we're, me and Christian and I are having together. He's the banker, I'm the customer. I tell him what I want, he thinks what he can give me. Um, remaining profitable, making sure that I don't go, don't, go, don't go bust because we're part of a community. If he messes around with me, I will ruin his reputation and his business will be bust. And I trust him because I know that, okay? So the future of banking is that. So right now, the only way we have to do this type of thing is through an app, okay? But that's not the future. The future is Web3, the future is embedded finance, the future is facial recognition. The fa Why do I have to carry a phone with me and to go to a store to pay? Why can't I just look at my face and say, oh, it's Alessandro, yes, what, what bank account does he want to use this one? Which one should he use? The bank tells me, okay, you're buying this thing, uh, your, the, the balance on this account is best, I'll use this one for you. The future is banking will become embedded in my daily life. And the place where this is more evident, what this prototype of this is more evident, is China, with WeChat Pay and all this kind of how, how payments are embedded in a lot of the social platform. So we are now stuck on the idea of the user experience on the app. Fundamental, important, but that's not the end point. If you look at banking in 20, 30, 40 years time, there's not gonna be an app there. There's gonna be me and relating with somebody that provides me that financial service. This entity there can be a bank, but it also can be a FinTech and also be an e-money issuer, could be whatever it is. And I will be able to do, find, find, new, find a way of achieving my goals, which remain the same as for the medieval bank. Borrow, pay, save, okay? So ultimately the app is irrelevant.
Go to you. Uh, no, actually, I, I would be aligned with you in what you just mentioned is um, the future of the bank is moving from valuing today the customer to providing value or better experience to yes. the customer, the outcomes, what you were referring to. So I'm quite aligned with what you, what and, you said. And, and interestingly, what David, you were saying, I, I think, yes, millennials are going to win because they are younger than non-millennials and they will be around for longer. But ultimately, a banking system that doesn't serve the older generations is failing. That is a failed system. <clears throat> so what's happening right now, the discussion of inclusion that you had, there's huge segments of society that are excluded from financial services that should be included. One are the less affluent mm -hmm. and the ones that don't have bank accounts. Mm -hmm. And I think a device that is connected to your mobile phone that allows you to authenticate yourself and be able to get credit, to be able to pay and receive payments is fundamentally important. But also for an older person, why do we want to force these guys to walk around with value and pieces of paper stuck in their wallets that can be taken away from them very easily. So also for them, we have to find a solution. So the embedded finance concept extended more rapidly than what it is right now is the solution for all so that we are not given money because we hold a device so we have a piece of paper in our hands, but because we are who we are. Very insightful, thank you. You guys talk a lot, so I should have prepared just one question, not so many. But I want to ask you the last question and I want all of you to answer one by one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what advice would you give to aspiring fintech entrepreneurs and professionals looking to make a meaningful impact in the financial landscape? Let's start with David. Can I go last? Is it okay uh, uh, in this question? What you said? Uh, can we start with the gentleman answering this question if it's acceptable? He wants to go, to go last. Them? He wants to go to last. Go I understand. Uh, if it's acceptable. What do you mean? Yeah. We are all gentlemen here. We are gentlemen. We're, We're not gentlemen. gentlemen. <laughs> okay. The, uh, the, the gentleman on my left. We're oh, both right. on your left. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, that, uh, the, I want to I'm, go. I'm, I'm not a gentleman? Or uh, you, you, you are equally infinitely highly qualified gentleman and it's more than a great honor to sit on your right uh, and uh, uh, I just want to give you the priority because I have a reason to go last so in let this. The gentleman to so my who left. wants to start? Yeah. Well, thank you and just for the pleasure to have a contradiction with you, the, the message that I want to convey is the collaboration between fintech and banks. <laughs> when you think about what banks are looking at, banks in a broader sense, right? They want to provide value to their customers. And what they do, they want to think about the end-to-end -end journey. So modernizing the front, the middle, and the back office. And what they do is actually selecting point fintechs the one that is very specialized in the customer engagement layer, not the one that is specialized, for example, in the middle office in product and pricing, and the other one in deposit products, as an example. All these fintechs, they come up with their own data model. Can you imagine a second the nightmare and the headaches for the banks to try to integrate all of this? They want to provide a better value to their customers, and the fintechs are making their life a little bit complicated. So this is where I see the collaboration, and for me, the glue of this collaboration is data, working together on data models, that the banks can leverage these data models together coming from the different fintechs working together to deliver faster, or to release faster value to their clients. Can I answer in, in two ways? Um, firstly, I would like to start of saying course. that's bullshit. Uh, and uh, in the no, sense that... I just want an advice for fintech entrepreneurs, please. <laughs> yes. He's advising me, it's fine too. So, that I, I com so put it more politely, I completely disagree. I, I think the job of the fintech is not to make their product compatible to the bank. The job of the fintech is to make the best possible product. And if the bank can adapt to them, it's the bank's problem, not the fintech's problem. Yeah, so I agree with disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, the advice, uh, going back to your question that you were you're saying that this, the, the advice that I would give is to think of in three dimensions every time you, you think about any problem. There's the child dimension, there's the adult dimension, and then there's the parent dimension, okay? On the child is that you have whims of what you want to do, so you think, I have this vision, I want to do it for sure, this is my vision, I'm going to go that. So you're not responsive, you're not behaving, you're having tantrums, etc. 
And on the parent perspective, you're saying, okay, I've created this thing, it's not making money, but this thing that is done the old style way can make money. If I stop doing the truly innovative and stick to something that makes money today, I can have a business that makes a little bit of money. Yes, it'll never become, re it'll never become really big, but it's going to be profitable and I will be able to, to, to go on holiday next year. So it's neither though I don't care about how, how money it makes, um, I'm going to do my vision, nor that, nor the one that I have to be very conservative. It's somewhere in between. So you need to be thinking about, am I focusing on the customer outcome? Am I doing it in a visionary way? Am I doing the best way possible to meet this? And while well, at the same time being innovative and profitable. So you have to be schizophrenic to be able to succeed as, a, as, a, as, an, as a entrepreneur. So the question was, what is my advice to fintech entrepreneurs, right? Or professionals. Okay. Yeah. I have six pieces of advice. But in these six... Sorry? That's one and two. I, 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 I can only listen. I have already learned a lot from them uh, in the past and even here. So I must listen, but listen to my six advice. Uh, and of course, fintech entrepreneurs should equally listen to them. Uh, and in my six pieces of advice, there is a little enigma, a little code hidden. I will help you, okay? You will solve this enigma, and I will help you. Watch the initials of my pieces of advice, and when I am listing the six pieces, after I have listed my six pieces of advice, you can shout the solution, okay? I trust you, you will solve this. So, first piece of advice, cashless. See, like cashless. Go cashless way. Uh, so, so someone is already, okay, don't be too early, don't be too early. Like I know there are geniuses around, but, but let's wait for each other. Second piece of advice, why generation focused, which is the why generation? Millennials, who are the millennials? People who became adults in the new millennium. Who became adults in the new millennium? People who were 18 or younger in 1982. Who were 18 or younger in 1982? People who are currently 41 or younger. Clear? Moving definition. Anyway, long story. Every demogra sociodemographic cohort is 15 years long, therefore born between 1982 and 1996. Why not 15? Why not 97? because 1982 itself is a year that counts. Long story. Okay, so, so far we have cashless, we have Y generation focused. Okay, now, third one, P like payments based. Payments is the name of the game because your active and passive products, lending, credit, and savings investments can be built on top of payments. Cashless, Y generation focused, payments based, real time rich data monetizing. What kind of rich data are we monetizing? Swift, hello, rich data from payments, ISO 2022 and way beyond, okay? Payments data will become rich and we can monetize that by building appropriate assets and liabilities around it. So, cashless, Y generation focused, Payments based, real time rich data monetizing, uniting users through digital financial inclusion, and finally, strategically aligned time scale of return and so on. So, shout the solution out. What is the solution? Shout it! Cyprus! Cyprus. Perfect. David, very, very wow, good. thank you so much okay. for the advice. Would you guys want to add anything else before we close the panel? How can we say anything after that? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you just nailed it. <laughs> you nailed it. Okay, I want to thank you all. <laughs> yeah, I've realized that. 
We are winning together. We are in co-opetition. Competition and cooperation. Agree. Thank you very much. Thank you all.